Well, good morning, church family. Would you all stand with us and sing? I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my turn till I met you. I was breathing, but not. All my failures I try to hide It was my turn Till I met you Sing it now, you call my name You call my name And I read out of that grave Church, I needed rescue. I needed rescue. My sin was heavy. Chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter. I was an orphan. Now you called me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healer. Now you're Oh 
his throne and came to us and set your heart upon the cross. We never know the sacrifice you made. church one name one name is higher one name is stronger than any grave than any throne Christ exalted over all the grave the death would die
Would you pray with me? Father, you truly are a king that is above all other kings. Lord, you are so, so, so worthy of our praise today. Father, focus our hearts. And as we open up your word and we hear more about you, more about the people that you want us to be, more about the calling that you have for us as your people. Father, focus us now. It's in your holy and precious name we pray, Lord. Amen. Y'all can go ahead and have a seat. We don't do spring cleaning here at this church. We do summer cleaning. And for all those that were working hard this week and getting our facility prepared for, well, the new ministry year, which is starting up real soon, thank you. As pastor who was not able to, well, chose not to do much cleaning, chose to go on vacation instead, I thank you for all who took part in that. It's not too late, men, to be involved in our men's retreat. Uh, It's next weekend. It starts Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And if you still would like to be part of that, see Pastor Tony out in the commons area, and he'll sign you up to be part of uh, the camping experience and uh, ministry that we have with the men. We are privileged this morning to have Todd Patterson. He's uh, one of our missionaries that we support. Uh, He and his wife and children Well, one children now are going back to Slovakia. One, the oldest, Elizabeth, is uh, going to be at Wheaton College. And I'll let Todd explain that more. Do you want to invite your wife up here? Come on, Yana, come on up here because this is going to be online. People all over the world will be able to see you. (laughs) This is Todd and Yana Patterson. Now, because not everybody's going to be able to come to lunch, I made a bad announcement about that earlier, but... It's only for a staff and missions team for lunch. Oh. So I was wrong. So if you thought I was inviting you all, I'm not. Um, so I want them to give a short little update before Todd opens the word so that the whole church can hear what's going on. You want to start? Go. Two minutes. <laughs> One. Okay. So um, you heard that um, we have two children, and our oldest, Elizabeth, is starting um, college. Uh, she ac- actually is already in an activity organized by Wheaton. And so our family is starting a new chapter, thank you, in our lives. So, uh, (laughs) yeah, so you can, well, like when you pray for us, you can remember that aspect of our lives too, that so that we would adjust well and that we would be able to continue being support to each other even though we'll be not together physically. And, and I, I, if you know about our ministry, Todd will say for himself, I teach at a, it's a, it's a, a Christian school, but it's an outreach of our congregation. So, and I work with first graders. I teach mainly English as a second language using various creative um, activities. And for the last two years, I had the privilege of also teaching Um, a Bible class that's an official part of our curriculum so there was a need so they um, asked me to fulfill that and it was a super super exciting experience because it was uh, really an opportunity to speak or teach the Bible you know directly and I'll maybe share just a couple prayer requests you can pray in September um, so next month uh, uh, we'll be having a meeting about the future of our seminary a really key moment, uh, because it's getting difficult just to maintain uh, the seminary. 
Um, I'll share more about that. Um, so that would be one thing, a really important meeting. Pray for that meeting in September. And then a second thing would be for uh, our congregation. We've been through a hard time. Uh, pastor left a year and a half ago, and uh, I think we've been handling it well, but uh, there's still, you know, with COVID, everything shut down. It's hard to reconcile and work through difficult relationships uh, until we start getting back together. And so that's, that's awaiting us to this fall. So I appreciate that. Okay. Why don't you stand one last time or before the message, and uh, if you're able, and we'll pray for these two requests. Lord Jesus, we do come before you thanking you for, um, as we've been singing, going to the cross purchasing our salvation through your shed blood. We thank you that the simplicity of the gospel is that all those who place their faith and trust in Jesus Christ as Savior have sins forgiven or adopted into your family, God. And most of all, we know that we have an inheritance of eternity waiting for us. Now, Lord, we do pray for Elizabeth as she starts her freshman year at Wheaton College. May it be a great year for her. May she develop a lot of friendships. May uh, her coursework be such that she is well prepared for that and, and she would excel at that. And then, Lord, for Todd and Jana and for Max as they go back to Slovakia and the family dynamics have changed a little bit. Uh, we know that with FaceTime and different ways of Zooming, they can keep in touch with their daughter. But yet there still is going to be a, a new experience as this couple, this family of four returns as a family of three. So, Lord, bless them. And I do pray for this big meeting of the seminary, uh, decisions to make. We want wisdom from above. We don't want man's wisdom at all. Uh, we want you to ordain uh, the aspect of that, that meeting so that your will will be done with regard to uh, keeping it open or, or changing in some format or closing it. So, Lord, go before Todd and, and others as they have this uh, meeting to determine the future of the seminary. And Lord, for the church, uh, the extra burden that was placed on Todd as one of the elders of that church, even chairman, uh, Lord, as they choose the next pastor, we ask that you would bring that pastor that would shepherd that flock, have be true to the word of God, be evangelistic minding, minded in getting the gospel out to so many people who need to hear it. And Lord... Um, we just pray for that church. All churches go through periods of struggle, and, and this is one of those. And so um, may your spirit work in the, the lives of each person on the elder board uh, that has to make decisions regarding the church. Lord, we love you. We know that you're not done with any of us yet, and so we ask that we would be faithful to the call, calling you've given to each one of us. Now bless Todd as he opens God's word for us, and may it uh, really speak to our hearts. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. Great. Well, in addition to you know, that little summary of our ministry, uh, Bob did ask me in, in, the, in the email that we were communicating back and forth to spend some time uh, showing our ministry and then opening the word. And I, for this little time before that, I thought instead of sharing so much about our ministry, I'd uh, share a little bit about you and your impact on me and us. Uh, because, um, I don't know, there are lots of faces that I, people that I know, lots of people that I don't know. So you might not know that I'm from uh, Durand, grew up in Durand, and, um, and grew up in, in this church, at least from the time that I uh, accepted the Lord uh, when I was in high school. And uh, so this is 2021, and that means it's, 30 years ago, uh, exactly 30 years ago, that I started training at International Teams in Prospect Heights to prepare to go to Slovakia for the first time. It was supposed to be a two-year short-term trip, and I was going to come back and go back into engineering. I studied engineering, uh, but it turned into much more than that. And so even during that first trip, when I went overseas, um, uh, faith community church was a part of uh, uh, been my support team and so right from the very beginning this church has been there but uh, even before that uh, in Durand 
long ago, there was this church called uh, Emmanuel Baptist Church of Durand, Illinois, and I'm, I suppose very few people have heard of that because it was only there for a short time. I was there, our, my family, we started to attend church there. All of us uh, were saved in that church, and then we were baptized together as a family. I think I was about a freshman in high school at the time. And uh, in those early days of my faith, I remember uh, telling my pastor then that, you know, I'm going to uh, start reading the Bible and start in Genesis. And his response was, well, good luck, you'll probably get stuck in Numbers. <laughs> Not exactly the encouragement I was looking for. And then uh, I also remember he would, he would talk about in his sermons, he'd talk about his professors where he went to seminary, and it sounded like they were people who enjoyed torturing other people. And, and uh, he didn't like school, and he especially didn't like Hebrew and Greek. You know, it was just horrible, these languages for him. And he would say that, you know, people can interpret Scripture any way they want to. You can just do about anything you want with, with God's Word. And so those are the things that I, and, and I, I'm sure he wasn't that bad of a guy, but <laughs> as a young believer, those are the things that, I, that, that came with me uh, when we left that church and we started attending this church. The church actually closed down and we started coming here. And that was right when Pastor Del Kinney uh, came back from seminary. He was at Dallas Seminary and came back to pastor this church that he had uh, years before, a few years before planted. And that's when, as I was sitting under his teaching, and I remember, for example, going through the book of Daniel with him. This is like 40, not quite, but almost 40 years ago. Plenty old enough to have a daughter going to college, Bob. <laughs> so this is like 40 years ago, preaching through Daniel. I remember that. And I remember, I remember his love for God's word. And I remember him talking about his professors. They were not the torturers. You know, he was, uh, I remember the stories about, you know, he, he would work to clean pools to put his, to get through seminary. And he was starting a family at that time. And he'd be in class and they'd be so tired because he, he and all his seminary buddies were, were doing that at the time. And they'd be kind of sleepy in class. And was it Howard Hendricks? Was he a famous Dallas? Yeah, so he would say, oh, you know, I know you're tired. It's, it's okay. Don't worry about it. It's just God's living word <laughs> that we're studying. So, and he was kind of a geek, you know. You could tell because he, he liked the Hebrew, and he liked the Greek. He liked digging into God's word, and he liked uh, expositing it, explaining what it means. You can't just do anything with God's word. It means something, and it's there to shape us. And that and, you know, just the priesthood of all believers, uh, that had a huge, Belkini had a huge impact on my life. I didn't even know it at the time. But looking back, I can see that that planted a seed in me, a love for God, a love for God's word, and a belief, a conviction that everybody can read God's word. And that's why I feel like the calling that God has over time built into my life is to help his people better read scripture and better live out God's story in everyday life. So <clears throat> that's our calling, and, and a lot of that comes out of this congregation, much more than I, I knew at the time, much more maybe than, than you realize. And I could go on and on with many other ways that this congregation has uh, come alongside us, uh, partnered with us in ministry, and has had an impact I think, on, on Slovakia. So I just want to say thank you to you as a congregation and to many of you who also, just as individuals, support us in our ministry. So I think I'd like to you know, transition into our sermon. We're looking at the whole book of Habakkuk today. 
the whole book of Haggai. We're not going to read the whole thing. We don't have time for all of that. But to transition into that, you can go ahead and look it up. I'm going to start with just a little prayer to uh, focus our hearts on, on God's word. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you are exalted God. That is true. That is true, and it is for us to recognize it. You are everlasting God, the same from the beginning, now, and forevermore. And it's our opportunity today to look into your scriptures and see how you have revealed yourself to us through this word, through your prophets, through the way that you have engaged with us in time and space. And so I just want to ask that you would open all of our eyes and ears and hearts to be able to see and hear and know that these words are for us. Help us all to be changed by your Holy Spirit, to better live under that truth that you are exalted and everlasting God, a God of mercy and loving kindness, the same from the beginning of time until now and forever. Please be with us. Please instruct us. Amen. So we're looking at Habakkuk. Habakkuk is one of the minor prophets. The fifth to last book in the Old Testament. I guess, is there a page number up there? I heard somebody talking about, get the page number right. 664, is that right? 664. So we're talking about Habakkuk. You can go ahead and turn there. Uh, And we're talking about disruption because that's what uh, Habakkuk and God are talking about in this book. Every once in a while, something happens that completely changes the status quo and brings huge disruptions, changes to life. Jan and I have been dealing with disruption in life and in ministry over the past couple of years. As I mentioned a year ago, or more than a year ago, our pastor of 18 years left our congregation under strained circumstances. And that was a big disruption for our congregation. It's also been, as Pastor Bob mentioned, a major disruption for our family since I happen to be the chair of the elder board at that time. And in Slovakia, the chair of the elder board inherits the responsibilities of the head pastor. And fortunately, I don't have to preach every Sunday. We have a a preaching team and we rotate. And a really good uh, and unified elder team that I'm thankful for that, that carries much of the load. But still that primary responsibility weighs on me. It's been a major disruption. And it's been hard for me to deal with because I feel like these are the most productive years of my life. And, and in the midst of these, what I see as, you know, potentially the most productive years, I've had to set aside those activities that, not completely set aside, but make some extra room for activities that I don't have so much of a passion for and put less time into those activities that for me are the things that God has been shaping me for and calling me to. That's been a major disruption. And then, of course, we all know COVID, which has been the granddaddy of all disruptions. COVID has disrupted the economics and politics of the entire world. It has even disrupted our churches, creating rifts between brothers and sisters. And we still don't even know all the ways that our lives will change as a result of COVID. In the Bible, the prophets are God's brokers in disruption. They point to coming changes that will rock the very foundations, not just of Israel, but the foundations of all nations. And the changes that the prophets pointed to were unpredictable, 
imaginable. The prophets predicted changes in the world order. They predicted the downfall of global powers that seemed to everyone to be indestructible. It would be like a prophet coming in 1980 and predicting the end of communism in Europe. Jan and my wife was at university in November of 1989 when communism fell in her home country of what was then Czechoslovakia. One month later, she was on the square of her hometown singing Christmas carols with a group of believers. That would never have been allowed under communism. Just a few weeks earlier, and Yana remembers thinking, I can't believe we're doing this. I can't believe this is okay. And maybe half expecting the police to show up any minute. Habakkuk was a prophet in Jerusalem, maybe 10 to 20 years before the disruption came. It was about the time when the Assyrians, the world power at the time, that, that power that no one thought could be beaten, they fell to the Babylonians. And it was at the time, before the time, when the Babylonians came to take people from Jerusalem's ruling and upper class, to take them away in chains and settle them in a faraway and foreign land. You can remember which prophet is Habakkuk because instead of God coming to him to point out Israel's unrighteousness, Habakkuk goes to God. He cries out to God, O Yahweh, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear? What Habakkuk finds out as he dialogues with God is that God is about to disrupt the world order in a way as big as the fall of communism or as big as COVID. God was about to do something his people would not believe even if someone were to tell them. So we're going to take a look, a closer look, at, what, at Habakkuk's question as we open up Habakkuk chapter 1 and I'll start reading in verse 2. O Yahweh, how long shall I cry for help, and you will not hear? Or cry to you violence, and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity, and why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed, and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous, so justice goes forth perverted. So unlike most other Israelites of the upper class, Habakkuk is not happy with the status quo in Jerusalem. And he doesn't go into the specifics, so we can't tell if what it is exactly that he's upset about. It could be that he's upset about them sacrificing children to pagan gods. It could be abortion. It could be the unfair treatment of the foreigner in their midst. It could be racism. It could be <clears throat> that it's the powerful taking advantage of the orphans and the widows. It could be human trafficking. We don't know what it is because he keeps it purposefully general. And then in verse 4 he says, the law is paralyzed. And he says again in verse 4, the wicked surround the righteous. He draws attention to this idea through a typical use of Hebrew wordplay. He says in the first half of verse 4 that justice never goes forth. And then he uses some of those same words and twists it around and says in the second half of verse 4, justice goes forth perverted. So maybe you've heard that line, if it weren't for bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. This is the same kind of thing. If it weren't for injustice, there'd be no justice at all. So 
Habakkuk-inspired hee-haw. If you, if you don't know hee-haw, you can just look up hee-haw bad luck and you'll get it right away and, and Google it. So the wordplay highlights the law God gave to Israel and the fact that God's people have deviated from his standard. God's own people who are supposed to adhere to to God's law so the nations could see God's justice and righteousness, they had abandoned God's good law. They were supposed to be a kingdom of priests who mediated the relationship between God and the nations. They were supposed to point the way back to God's presence and blessing and life. They were actually supposed to not only point to it, but be the way back. And this is what Habakkuk cries out against. How long is God going to tolerate this injustice, this bearing of God's name in vain? And that's what that commandment means. Do not bear the Lord your God's name in vain. It's not so much about a specific way of speaking. It's about how we bear or carry the image of God. It's how well we image God. So Habakkuk is crying out against this injustice, against this inability of the Israelites to bear God's name. If the leaders themselves are corrupt, then when is God going to act and finally set right his plan of salvation? That is Habakkuk's question, and God responds. And now we can look at God's response, starting in chapter 1, verse 5. Look among the nations and see, wonder and be astounded, For I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, that bitter and hasty nation who march through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings not their own. They are dreaded and fearsome. Their justice and dignity go forth from themselves. And then verse 9 They all, the Babylonians, come for violence, all their faces forward. They gather captives like sand. Habakkuk has complained about the injustice he's seen in Jerusalem and asked God when he will set it right. When God answers, he blindsides Habakkuk. God knows that what he is about to say is going to rock the foundations of Habakkuk's world. And he even sets it up that way. So in verse 5, he says, I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. Okay, he's going to do something surprising, but what is so surprising then about what he says? It sounds like all the other prophets. Well, God says he's going to send the evil and violent Babylonians to put an end to the injustice of Jerusalem. Okay, wait a minute. It's true, there's injustice in Jerusalem. But the Babylonians? The Babylonians are more godless and far more unjust than the Israelites. They're on a rampage, destroying nations and carting their inhabitants off into captivity. They don't just do local violence like the Israelites do. They do global violence. And remember that wordplay from Habakkuk's question? It shows up again in God's response. Habakkuk complained, if it weren't for injustice, there'd be no justice at all. And now in verse 7, God talks about the justice that comes out of Babylon. He says it's a justice and a dignity or an exaltation that comes forth from themselves. They are doing 
whatever they think is right in their own eyes. They are doing whatever they want to exalt themselves. This is no justice at all. How can this come from God? This is boundless bedlam. This is merciless death, disorder, and destruction. God's response, it seems to Habakkuk, is over the top. I talked about the disruption that came with the fall of communism. But for Christians, that was a good disruption. It brought about a change that believers all over the world had been praying for for a long time. The kind of disruption that God is showing to Habakkuk is the opposite. Instead of the fall of communism, it's like the rise of communism. Instead of the release of the oppressed, it's the oppression of God's people. How can this be? Habakkuk is dumbfounded, and so he comes to God a second time with another question, one more urgent even than the first. God's answer to Habakkuk made him question not only the world around him, but he's now questioning the very idea of who God is. Obviously, Habakkuk thinks, God is different than I imagined. So now we'll read, starting in verse 12 of chapter 1. Are you not from everlasting, O Yahweh, my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. O Yahweh, you have ordained them as a judgment, and you, O Rock, have established them for reproof. You who are of too pure eyes than to look upon evil and cannot look at wrong, why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? In verse 17, is he then to keep on emptying his net and mercilessly killing nations forever? We shall not die. Habakkuk says, he says it as a statement, but it betrays his uncertainty. And it's not really, like it seems on the surface, uncertainty about the fate of Israel. Are we going to die? It's uncertainty about who God is. And that's why he starts, are you not from everlasting? O Yahweh, my God, my Holy One. That's the root of his uncertainty. Who is God? How can this be, he says? I thought you were God everlasting. I thought you were God the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. I thought you were a God of steadfast love, always faithful to the covenant with Israel. We shall not die. It's not a question about the fate of Israel so much as a question about the fate of the covenant between Israel and God and whether or not God is who he said he is. A faithful God from beginning to end. Are you going to use this horrid nation Babylon to bring your people and your covenant to an end? Is this the end of a hope for salvation? All Habakkuk can do now is wait and watch for an answer. And that's what he does, looking now at chapter 2, verse 1. I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. And Yahweh answered me, Write the vision, make it plain on tablets, so he may run who reads it, so the message can go out right away. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, 
Wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Behold, his soul is puffed up. He's talking about Babylon. Babylon's soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him. But, on the other hand, the righteous shall live by his faith. Verse 6. Shall not all these, and now he's talking about the nations that Babylon has oppressed, shall not all these take up their taunt against him, Babylon, with scoffing and riddles for him and say, Woe to him who, who heaps up what is not his own. For how long? And loads himself with pledges. Will not your debtors suddenly arise and those awake who will make you tremble? Then you, Babylon, will be spoiled for them, the nations that Babylon has oppressed. In verse 16, you, Babylon, will have your fill of shame instead of glory. Drink yourself and show your uncircumcision. The cup in Yahweh's right hand will come around to you, and utter shame will come upon your glory. Verse 20, but Yahweh is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. What God is saying here is that while he will use Babylon to bring justice on Israel, Eventually, he will bring justice to Babylon as well. And so that is why he says near the end in verse 20, Yahweh is in his holy temple. The temple is not the place where God goes into it in order to hide out. In the temple, in the holy of holies, there is God's throne. And when God is in his temple, he is on his throne, exercising his power over all his domain. But God's domain is not just Israel. This is what Habakkuk forgot. God's domain is all the earth. And that is why he says in verse 14, we skipped over that, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of Yahweh as the waters cover the sea. God is not a local God, a parochial power. He is the creator of heaven and earth, the one and only God over all creation, over every king and principality. He alone holds the fate of the universe in the palm of his hand. And now we can begin to see what God is doing. Habakkuk was concerned with justice for Jerusalem, for that small little nation that at this time is little more than a few cities. Habakkuk desired salvation for God's people, and he couldn't understand why God delayed, why he hadn't acted to bring justice and righteousness long ago. When God reveals to Habakkuk the disruption that he is about to bring to the status quo, he reveals that his plan of salvation goes beyond Israel to the entire world. God has a plan to bring salvation to all nations, to every corner of the globe. So the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of Yahweh as the waters Cover the sea. This bursts Habakkuk's boundaries and expands his vision. In this new vision, God lifts Habakkuk's eyes to the endless horizon, even to the unthinkable. 
God's desire is for the salvation of Israel, for sure, but much more. God's desire and his plan from the beginning is for the salvation of all people, all nations. This is the thing that Habakkuk would not have believed even if someone were to tell him. I think it's good to reflect on this in our COVID context. So far we've seen that God has shown Habakkuk that a terrible disruption is coming. A judgment is coming. For a time, this disruption and judgment is going to come upon God's own people. All of his people are going to have to suffer for a time. But the suffering of God's people is a part of his larger plan to bring salvation beyond the walls of Jerusalem so that people from every tribe and tongue may be saved. In our politically correct 21st century, we don't like to talk about pandemics being God's judgment. But this pandemic is God's judgment. COVID is a reminder that we are all sinners. We are all separated from God and we all need his salvation. COVID is and should be a reminder not only for those who scoff at God and reject his standards and mores and salvation. COVID is a reminder for us that we also have fallen short when it comes to upholding God's standard and being an example of God's love and mercy to those who are far from him. We have failed at bearing God's name and his image. I really want to encourage you to reflect on this judgment of God because God addresses us. O church, do not bear his name in vain. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and soul and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. How are you doing loving God and loving your neighbor in the midst of this pandemic? How are you doing bearing God's name before all the nations during COVID? And I want to warn you, do not forget that the prophets came first to God's people. And God's people always rejected their message. The message that came from God himself. They rejected it because their gospel, their God, was too small. And we are not immune to that same tendency. If you hear this message from Habakkuk and say to yourself, aha, the pandemic is judgment on those godless Democrats or whoever, then you may very well be the one for whom this message is attended, intended, the one whom God is chastising. Listen humbly to the prophets. Reflect on your life. How are you loving the Lord your God? How are you loving your neighbor? Let's go back to the text. We know that Habakkuk's understanding of God and of God's plan of salvation were indeed not only disrupted, and that, but then expanded into a new understanding of God, of his loving kindness and faithfulness and his desire to bring salvation 
to all nations, even though there would be a horrible time of suffering at first. We can see Habakkuk's vision broadened, and that it has broadened, because in chapter 3, he composes a musical prayer to express his amazement and wonder at who God is. We don't have time to read the whole thing. And there's, of course, a whole sermon on just this chapter. But we'll start in verse 16. I hear, and my body trembles. My lips quiver at the sound. Rottenness enters into my bones. My legs tremble beneath me. Yet I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon people who invade us. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the produce of the olive fail and the fields yield no food, though the flock be cut off from the field and there be no herd in the stalls, Yet I will rejoice in Yahweh. I will take my joy in the God of my salvation. Yahweh, the Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on my high places. COVID is a form of God's judgment a reminder that we are sinners separated from God and very much in need of his justice and his mercy. Habakkuk's message is appropriate for this prolonged period of disruption. Habakkuk's vision was at first myopic, narrowed down to Israel, He could not lift his eyes. He was not able to lift his eyes and see God's ultimate plan of salvation. And that is why God disrupts. God lifted his eyes. God lifts our eyes and expands our vision by showing, by bringing disruption. When God intervenes in this world to judge, His judgment is not his final word. When God judged Israel by sending the Babylonians, the Israelites felt a measure of his wrath. We feel a measure of God's wrath now in this pandemic. But God's wrath through the Babylonians and God's wrath in COVID, is tempered by his mercy. When Christ was on the cross, God's wrath against sin was not tempered. Christ bore the full measure of our sins. But his wrath was not his final word. That was not the end of the Messiah or the end of Israel. It was not the end of God's covenant. It was only the beginning. Even this pandemic is a reminder that God has not given up on us. It's a reminder that he is very much active in our world. And what followed God's wrath? Victory over sin when he raised his Christ from the dead. 
And then came mercy when he clothed us, those of us who have put our faith in him. He has clothed us in the righteousness of Christ. We are covered in the righteousness that does not belong to us, but comes from Christ. And this salvation, this righteousness, is for everyone. It is for Jews and for Gentiles. It is for blacks and for whites, for homosexuals and heterosexuals, for Democrats and Republicans, for all who will repent of their sin and put their faith in him. Salvation is for the ends of the earth. I pray, O church, that through this pandemic, God will expand our vision to see his great plan and his great love and mercy and faithfulness, his salvation, and that we would see our role in being examples of his loving kindness and faithfulness, even of his righteousness, that we would see our role in bearing God's name well, being his image, being a part, you have a part in God's plan for salvation to the ends of the earth. Amen. Would you all stand and respond and sing?
That's a prophetic word for today, isn't it? People in the world think that God is only a God of judgment. They forget he's a God of love. And we love because he first, he loved us. And he showed that by sending his son to die in our place to pay for our sins. There's no other God like our God. And we are commissioned to tell this world. And as Todd has brought out so clearly, there's salvation and it's in the name of Jesus Christ. And the world needs to hear about that name. And they need to hear it from us. Thank you, Todd, for bringing us the word this morning. Right after I get done praying, Todd will be up here to greet anybody that wants to greet him. But if there is an issue on your heart that you want prayer for, we'll have some elders up here. I'll be up here, too, to pray for you. And if you don't know this Jesus that Todd was even sharing about, that God sent his son because he loves the world. And you want the salvation. We're up here for helping point you to the way for receiving Christ. Lord, it's been good to be in this place at this time to hear a word from, from our brother, our missionary, Todd Patterson. It's amazing how even in the Old Testament we can learn so much. All scriptures inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, and for instructing us in righteousness. And so, Lord, for every person watching online or here in person, may this message resonate with them. If they need to do business with you to get right before you, may they do that. Lord God, we love you because you loved us and sent us your son. And it's in his name I pray. Amen.